I used to live in an apartment on the first floor. I had a neighbor named Joe right next to me, and two more neighbors on the sides. One evening while the sun was setting, Joe knocked on my door. He was a bit chubby, had brown hair with a bowl cut, wore glasses, and had on a button-down shirt. He said he went to different doors, asking if someone could take care of his dog over the weekend, because he had to go on a sudden work trip. I said yes to watching his dog, thinking about possible issues that could come up. So I asked for his phone number, just to be prepared in case something happened. But that was a big mistake from my side. I didn't realize it back then, obviously. I just wanted to be a good neighbor. Then we talked a bit about video games and playing Dungeons and Dragons, and it seemed like we had a lot in common. I was just being friendly, nothing more. I had my wedding ring on, and I made sure to show it by brushing my hand across my face. My husband was away at that time, and I didn't think much about it. Joe came back on Monday morning, and I gave him his key. I didn't ask for any money, but he said he wanted to repay me in a different way. Then Joe mentioned his office was having an escape room event, and he could bring a friend. I agreed, thinking it could be fun, as he seemed like a cool person, and maybe we could become good friends. When the day arrived, I wasn't feeling well, so I spent the day on the couch, cuddled up with my sweet cockapoo named Cortana. I was really sick, and couldn't go to work that day. I texted Joe to say I couldn't make it to the event, and told him not to worry about paying me back. Joe replied with a simple, uh, okay. I didn't say anything back, and just went to sleep. He kept texting me over the next few weeks, but I didn't understand what he was saying until the very end. Few days later, he suddenly texted me, asking why I didn't invite him to play Dungeons and Dragons. At first, I was puzzled because I didn't tell him about it, so my guess was that he heard me talking in the hallway as I left with my friend. But after that, things started getting a bit weird. Right outside his door, there's a good-sized area of grass, where I'd take Cortana to do her business. She's usually a calm dog, sniffing around on the ground, and not really looking up when she's exploring or going to the bathroom. But this time, out of nowhere, Cortana turned towards the window where the blinds were shut tight, and started barking like crazy. So I felt really embarrassed about it. Cortana had never acted like that before. I tried pulling her and telling her to be quiet, but she wouldn't listen. Every day when we went to that grassy area in the afternoon, she would bark like crazy at that window. So I decided to take her somewhere else to see if it would make a difference. And it did. I went back after about a week and found out that the blinds were pulled all the way to the top. The window opened and Joe popped his torso all the way out, stretching his arms to the sky. My first initial thought was just, who does that? I say an awkward hello, and then hurry Cortana along and back into our apartment. A few days later, there's knocking on my door almost every night. To see who it is, I quietly go to the door and find out it's Joe, just standing there, peeping through the hole. After a while, I get a text from Joe, asking if he can take me out to dinner. I'm totally confused, staring at the message and not sure what to say. He sends another message saying, I'm just trying to be friendly after you didn't come last time. Sorry for being friendly. I wish I had a picture of my face because I must have looked so shocked that even Cortana sat up to stare at me. I want to make it very clear. I'm a busy person with a lot of happening in my life, so I usually don't reply to texts right away like never. At that point... I was pretty scared. I called my mom and told her what was going on. I worried about what might happen if this guy tries to break into my apartment and hurt me. All because I couldn't make it to some event and felt too sick. My mom suggested I firmly tell him that my husband wouldn't like me having dinner with another man and that his behavior was inappropriate. It was strange, but Joe only stopped bothering me when I talked about my husband, ignoring him. Avoiding him, or quickly leaving when he opened his door didn't work. Even after that, Cortana would still growl at the window. I moved out of that apartment, and thankfully, I never heard from Joe again. In my country, you can only buy alcohol when you're 18. So if you don't have a fake ID or your parents don't help you, then you have to wait outside the liquor store. 
It's like a shop that sells drinks. You wait until someone agrees to go inside and buy the alcohol for you. So we waited. Then a few minutes later, we found a person who said yes to buying our alcohol and asked him to get a few bottles of vodka for me and a couple of friends. Two friends were with me, and we were meeting another friend after we finished doing this. Now, since it was about 6 p.m., we thought it was too risky to pour our vodka into a different bottle on the crowded street. So, like we usually do in this situation, we found a nearby place that sells food. We quickly went inside and used the bathroom to pour our alcohol into another container. And after that, we were ready to continue having a good time. This time, we decided to do it in a nearby McDonald's. We knew it was a safe choice because we had done it there before. So we went into the McDonald's and headed straight for the bathroom, just like we had done many times. Me and my two friends, Harriet and Kara, all went into one bathroom stall to do what we needed to do. As I mentioned before, we had done this a lot, and we usually picked this McDonald's because it was often busy, and people didn't pay much attention to three teenagers going straight to the bathroom without buying anything. We finish what we're doing, and as we're about to leave the bathroom stall, we hear a giggle. Guess where it's coming from? I look up and see the forehead and eyes of a guy, maybe around 30 years old, peeking out from under a lifted tile in the ceiling. We're all surprised, just looking at this guy who starts giggling and asking for our names, where we're going. And if he can join us, we're shocked because seriously, who expects to find a random guy in the ceiling of a McDonald's? Being a teenager who felt invincible, I told the guy he was creepy and to go away, but the guy seemed to enjoy this and giggled a little more, still shifting around in the ceiling, never taking his eyes off of us. Now I should probably mention that, along with pouring our drinks into other bottles, we pre-rolled a few joints. So we were scared to alert anyone at this point, as we were young and terrified of our parents finding out about it. The guy, still staring at us, keeps asking questions like, How old are you boys? Where do you live? Can I have some of your drink? He's still moving around a lot up there. Then he starts lifting the tile. We're all stuck in the bathroom stall with this guy above us. We realize the only way for him to come down is to drop right on top of us. So we left there really fast. We went outside and talked about what to do. I chose to go back in and tell someone, because it's a very busy McDonald's, and I knew there would be ladies and kids using the toilets until they closed. I didn't want to take a chance that the weird guy would stay up there to watch them, especially since I saw what he was doing. I went in and told a worker that I'd been in the bathroom for a long time talking on the phone. It was a bad lie, but I was too scared to tell the truth in case they called the police. Surprisingly, when the guy showed up, the staff didn't seem shocked at all. They were just mad, more than anything. I saw some guys who worked there go into the bathroom, and I thought they could take care of it, so I left. We still went to that McDonald's but we never saw that weird guy in the bathroom again. We don't know if he got caught because we didn't hear anything about it later. This happened almost 10 years ago when I was 13. My friend and I were super excited because it was our first time going trick or treating without our parents. We lived in a small town where not much happened and we thought it would be just a regular night. It started just like any other Halloween night. We went around collecting candy, bumped into a bunch of our friends from school and had a blast. Around 8 p.m., we realized it was time to go home. But on our way back, we stopped by our teacher's house. She wasn't there, and the street was pretty dark because there weren't many street lights. On top of that, most houses had their lights off, and the Halloween decorations were taken down. So my friend and I felt a bit scared and disappointed because there wasn't much candy on that street. But suddenly, a man came out from under a street light. He turned out to be a police officer. We didn't notice him before, because it was dark. He surprised us, but he was really nice. The cop introduced himself and pointed to a regular house. Then he told us that an older man in that house was inviting trick-or-treat inside. He said that someone called the police, but when they got there, nobody answered the door. Then he kept saying that his police car and partner were just around the block. 
We looked around, but we couldn't see the police car and partner. I was a bit paranoid as a kid. My mom loved watching crime shows, and she'd share little lessons with me. One of them was about fake cops, although I can't remember the details. Some people pretend to be police officers to make others trust them. After that, I felt scared during the whole conversation, as something felt off because he didn't have a badge, police car, or partner. But at the same time, he was smiling and seemed like he really wanted to help us. And that made us confused. Then things got weird when he made a strange request. He said he needed to talk to a potential predator and wanted our help. Because we were young girls, he wanted us to knock on the man's door and he would hide behind the bushes. The plan was to wait for the man to invite us in, and then the cop would jump out and catch him. At that moment, I knew my friend felt the same as me. We both went quiet. But one of us managed to ask if we could talk about it. The cop agreed, but said we didn't have much time, as he could hear everything in the quiet street. I remember feeling like I wanted to say something, but I was too scared he would hear us and make things worse. We just stared at each other for a really long time. The cop was getting annoyed and told us to decide quickly. Just then, a family came down the street and saw the officer. They were coming over to see what was going on, but that's when the cop said he'd be right back and told us not to leave. My friend and I quickly gathered our thoughts and decided to run away. We sprinted out of the street and didn't look back. On our way home, we talked about different ideas, like him being a fake cop, playing a prank, or maybe us just misunderstanding the situation with a real cop. When we told our parents, we made it sound less serious and doubted what happened. We didn't call the police, but our dad went to the house and around it. There were no cop cars or officers anywhere. Over the years, I regret not calling the police. We told our class the next day, and most, including our teacher, didn't think it was a big deal. Looking back, it's strange that a police officer would put two kids in such a possibly dangerous situation. I really wonder why he did it. But sadly, it will stay a mystery. And I guess that's just how things go sometimes. It's hard to sleep at night, since I live in an abandoned apartment building. I find some covers once in a while, but it's still no use. When I go outside, it's warm, the sun beating on my face and the smell of pastries from the shop down the street. As I was walking, I found a $20 bill under a rock in the road. Yes, I, I say as I flew my hands in the air. I remove the rock from above the bill. When I slip it in my pocket, I start to walk to the pastry shop. When I get there and open the door, I'm welcome with a smile of a woman. Her hair is a golden blonde with a red bow on her side. Her smile is bright and beautiful, and she's wearing an apron that has pink flowers all over it with some pens and straws in her pocket. Hello? Can I help you with anything? She asked, her voice is soft and energetic. I'm looking for something to calm my sweet tooth, I tell her. Well, feel free to look at our pastries she tells me. I nod and walk off to look at some of the pastries. When I won, I ask how much it costs. That's his $18, sir. The woman told me. Then I'll take that one, I told her. All right, I'll ring you up in the front. I nod and she brings the pastry to the front, bags it up, and I check it out. As I headed back to the building, I see a man in black headed to the ally with two big dumpsters. Hey! I yell. The man doesn't respond but simply looks at me then disappears into the ally. I chase after him but when I reach the ally he isn't there. I looked around a little but still nothing. And the weirdest part was that there were no doors or even a fence just brick walls. I shrug my shoulders and walk back to the entrance of the ally. I made it back to my apartment up to my room. Oddly, the blankets I collected the night before disappeared from the mattress I slept on. What the? I thought. Probably just some other homeless people like me. Look out the broken window, which was no use considering the sun was setting and was too bright to look out. I covers my eyes and looked back at my pastry. I sighed a sigh of relief and unboxed the sweet dessert. Just then I heard a woman scream and I yelled surprised by how loud it was. 
Just then I heard her crying. I listened closely and realized the crying was coming from my room. That's weird. I thought I'm pretty sure I closed my door. I looked back to saw the door was closed. Then I looked around my room. It was dark now, so I had to put my hands out and looked for the light switch. I found it and flicked it on. I screamed as I saw a corpse on the mattress, blood covering the mattress and dripping blood down the metal posts. I backed up slowly, not taking my eyes off the body on my bed. I felt the doorknob and flung it open as I fell from the door. But all I saw was another door. I went through that door, but all I saw was another room with another dead corpse on the same bed. And it was different this time, a hand with long black and sharp fingers. So I went into the room. But as soon as I did, I heard the door slam behind me. BAM! I screamed and put my hands up in a fist. The light flickered and the hands were gone. I felt my face go dark. I laughed and told myself that this isn't real. The light flickered again, and this time the body was gone. So was the blood, and one blanket was on the bed. I laughed and walked over to the bed. It was dry. I got under the covers and started to go to sleep. I woke up sweaty and scared. I saw red eyes and that same long black hand reaching towards me. I swung my head around looking for something to use for a weapon. I found a crowbar. I grabbed it and swung it around. I felt it hit something hard and heard a smash as glass broke and a thud I heard another ear shrieking scream. I ran out of the building and out on the empty streets. To this day, I still fear that if I shut any door before dark, that thing might come back to kill me. Although it doesn't seem like it, this happened quite a while back, probably over ten years ago. I was in the later years of high school and was home alone. My parents were at a wedding that required them to stay at a hotel, and my brother worked the night shift. At that time, my family lived in a very well-known East Coast city, inside of a blue-collar neighborhood that was just starting to take a nosedive. As a teenager, I was a bit of a loner. I wasn't a nerd or anything. I was a big dude who had friends and went on dates, but I'm naturally an introvert, so I cherish the rare alone time that I got. This weekend I was looking forward to engaging in my normal empty house routine. Play some PlayStation on the big screen TV, order some late takeout dinner and watch some Dragon Ball Z, then around 2 a.m. fall asleep on the couch with my old dog Cecil. Cecil was an old beagle and had been in our family for about eight years now. He was quiet and peaceful and spent his time begging for food and sleeping. Unlike most beagles, Cecil never howled or barked. He was more than content to rest his head on your lap and spend the night there. Anyways, it was about 1 a.m. now, and I had just finished the last slice of pizza and was starting to doze off the couch when I hear a bang coming from the back alleyway. I didn't think much of it. Anyone who's lived in the city knows noises happen at all moments of the night. Cecil's head popped up off my lap and the hair on his back stood up. He's always been a bit skittish, so I calmed him down and started dozing off again. But not more than two minutes later, I hear another bang. Cecil did something I never saw him do before. He leaped off the couch and ran like the winds towards the door leading to the basement, barking and growling like a dog twice his size. The look on his face reminded me of a German shepherd canine unit. I'd never seen him act like that before, which got my adrenaline pumping. Through the dog's barking, I can now make out a persistent banging. There was a seldom used door in the basement that led to our back alleyway. It was old and rusted and was hard to open even with a key, and it made a lot of noise. I suddenly realized that someone was trying to break into my house through my basement door. For those who haven't lived in a bad neighborhood, it's usually general knowledge that if someone tries to get into your house and moves on after they realize the door is locked, they only wanted your stuff. But if someone is persistently trying to get into your house despite the door being locked, well, they want you. Knowing this, I rushed upstairs immediately to grab a heavy wood baseball bat that I kept under my bed for situations like this. Then I head down to my basement. I probably should have ran, but I was a macho teenager with a tough guy complex and I had nowhere to go. While I'm heading down the stairs to my basement, 
Cecil blows past me with the speed and aggression of a dog half his age. Suddenly I hear a man's voice say, Oh fuck, and the banging stopped. I didn't call the cops or anyone else, which was probably the dumbest thing I've ever done. I just sat up for the rest of the night with the bat in my hand. My brother came home that morning and I told him what had happened. He went to the basement door to take a look, and when he gave it a tug to open it, the whole door fell off. This psycho was one good shove away from getting in my house, but old Cecil scared him off. I'm pretty sure that lazy, fat old dog saved my life. When I tell this story to people, they dismiss his actions as a dog doing what a dog is supposed to do. But I can tell you that Cecil never barked or moved that fast in his life. It was almost like he knew the urgency, like he knew that door was gonna give. A few years back, we had to have him put down, cause he just had no will to live anymore. Before the injection, I got a moment alone with him. I thanked him one last time for his friendship and for what he did that night. At this point, I was a grown man with a wife and kids, but I'm convinced none of that would have happened without old Cecil. I was around 13 at the time of this story. I still live in this house, and I still don't know what this was. A thunderstorm had just started, and due to our area being in Tornado Alley, I always slept downstairs in my dad's room, just to be safe because I'm a heavy sleeper. It was around 12.43 a.m., sitting on my phone watching YouTube to pass time. As the rain hit the house, I heard my dad's intense car base pull up into the driveway. I lived in a small town, and everybody knows everybody, and he was the only one with a car like that. I assumed he would be coming downstairs to sleep since he had been working all night, and so I collected my things and my dog and sat at the edge of the bed waiting. After waiting for a few minutes, I ended up walking over to the window that faced directly towards the driveway. Through this window, I could see the entirety of the driveway, so there was no way any car in the driveway wouldn't be seen. But there wasn't a car. There was nothing. I thought I had probably just mixed up a car passing on the highway next to us, because I remember my dad had also said that he would only be home around 2 a.m. I walked over and sat back down, but almost immediately I realized the car-based sound never left the driveway. I was spooked, but eventually I thought nothing of it, seeing as people park randomly around houses a lot. A few minutes passed by, and I heard my dad's cough in the garage. I thought he was home, and I was relieved because the storm was beginning to pick up. But it only frightened me more when I realized that I never heard the garage door open. I was too spooked to look out the window again, and so I waited. A few minutes passed by, and the rain now hitting the house harder with thunder and lightning getting louder and brighter. Heard my dad's voice call out my name softly. Never. At that moment, I realized that there was someone in my house or something... I had frozen place, listening. I turned and looked at my dog, noticing his confused look towards me as if he didn't hear anything. I slowly sat back down and just laid as still and quietly as I could until I eventually passed out. I woke up at 4 a.m. and immediately ran to the window and saw my dad's car, and so I ran upstairs. I told him everything that had happened, and I don't believe in ghosts or anything, but I knew something had called my name that wasn't my father that night. I can't help but wonder what would have happened if I had walked up those stairs and followed the voice. We don't know what really happened that night, but I can't help but feel uncomfortable in my own house now. I was lucky enough to live in a large house when I was a kid. My house had a side room towards the back side of the first floor. My siblings called it the second living room because that's basically what it was. It had an old recliner, a small table, and a mid-sized couch. That's it. We hardly ever sat in there. One morning I woke up sick. I told my mom and she told me to take the day off from school and stay home. My siblings had to be at school and my parents worked. So that meant I had the house to myself. 
I laid around in bed for a few hours, until around 10.30 a.m., when I heard steady walking coming from the first floor. I thought nothing of it at first, as I just assumed maybe my mom went in late to work like she did sometimes. I needed something to eat anyway, so I stood up and went downstairs to the kitchen. I made it about three feet in front of my kitchen's walk-in doorway when I locked eyes with not my mom, but a six-foot-tall man wearing raggy and ripped-up clothes. I was frozen in fear. I just stood there. It was only for a few seconds, but it felt like hours had... The guy just stood there and watched me, too. No expression or anything. I eventually pulled myself out of the shock and bolted from my bedroom upstairs. I didn't hear him following me, but I got in my bedroom and locked the door and moved a dresser in front of it anyways. I pulled out my phone and instead of calling 911 like I should have, I called my mom. I screamed into the phone telling her someone was in the house trying to kill me. She told me not to leave my room for any reason and call the police. So I did. Fifteen minutes later, the police finally show up, as I could see through my bedroom window. I watched them enter the house before I left my room to run down to them for safety. I told them everything that happened. They did a quick search of the home and found nothing. Not a single person or broken window or door. My parents came home shortly after. That the guy had not been caught, I was extremely angry as well, but I was also relieved that I was alive. The police began packing their things, but as one of the last officers was on the way out, he noticed a Walmart bag sticking out from under our couch. It was that couch in the side room that no one ever used, and well what do you know we found hundreds of trash bags and weak old rotting food under the couch, along with some of our personal items like wipes, water bottles, and we even found a bag of piss. Whoever that man in the kitchen was had been living under our couch for weeks. I can't comprehend how none of us had smelt any of the garbage that was piled up under there for the entire time he was there. The fact that he never made a single noise under there just baffles me. We've since cleaned that room out completely and turned it into a breakfast nook with wooden chairs so no more people can break in and find free housing in the... I go off to college in a few months, so I won't have to live in fear of that incident happening again for much longer but I still think about it every time I wake up. There was always a myth in the town I lived in, where if you went out hiking or mountain climbing, etc., an old man and two other kids would follow you home. I thought it was bullcrap, obviously. I mean, how could you believe the same old man and the same two kids could follow people home each day? That's what I wanted to believe. I moved into my new house a week ago with my dog Sparky, so I can visit my girlfriend more often, Chelsea. From where I moved in, she's now only a block away. We said that now I've moved closer, we can do more fun activities. But one of the activities we mentioned stuck out to me more than the others, mountain climbing. I told her the mountain climbing idea wouldn't be so bad, since there was a mountain only three miles away, so we agreed to do it the next day. I mentioned the idea to my friend an hour after me and Chelsea had that conversation, he told me to cancel. I asked him why, and he texted back saying, Look, you can go if you like, but be careful of the old man and his two kids. I had heard the myth before, I thought it was stupid, so I said how I felt, that's a stupid myth. He left me on read for a couple hours after that, but then replied, If you go missing, don't say I didn't warn you. The next morning, me and Chelsea drove to the mountain. I mentioned the thing my friend said to me to Chelsea. She agreed with me of how it's stupid. We got to the mountain, got our gear ready, and headed out. Thirty minutes in, the walk was tiresome. We thought it'd be a short walk since the mountain looked small, but we can't walk back down now. One hour in... The phone service was terrible by this point. It was 1 p.m. now, so we had to finish this walk soon, otherwise it would get dark. Two hours in, the sun was setting. I was growing worried by the minute. Three hours in, it was dark and our phones were dead. We couldn't go back and we couldn't keep going up. We were just forced to stay in the forest area of the mountain. We were aimlessly wandering for a bit, until Chelsea stopped walking. I asked her what was up, and she said, They're looking. 
I looked around for a bit, but saw nothing apart from nearby trees and darkness. I looked back at her and said, Chelsea, stop, this isn't funny. And then, with the most horrified look on her face, she turned to me and said, I'm not trying to be funny. I then heard a howling, maybe about eight ft away from me and Chelsea. I grabbed her hand tight and ran in a random direction, away from the howling. I didn't look behind me and I didn't want to. I just wanted to get off this mountain. But then I heard two kids crying, blood-curdling screams of terror. I let go of Chelsea's hand, looked her dead in the eyes and said, Be careful when going down, okay? I'm just going to see if those kids are fine. And I ran in the direction of the cries, leaves rustling beneath my feet, chest pounding, eyes adjusting to the darkness. I went through it all just to find these kids. But when I found them, they weren't crying, or alone, or scared, or any type of emotion. They were just staring at me, while a taller figure, with his hands on each of the children's shoulders, looked about seventy to eighty, was smiling at me. I froze and held my breath. I couldn't move. I didn't want to move. I just stood there, vulnerable to anything these people wanted to do to me. But then, only adrenaline took over. I bolted the other way. The fastest I've ever ran in my life was now. I didn't look back. Eventually, I tripped and started to tumble down the mountain for what felt like hours. And eventually, I blacked out. I opened my eyes, bruises all over my body, scratches and cuts everywhere and damp leaves stuck to my body. I looked around. I was in the car park and the sun was coming up. I got up and ran to the nearest park, where I found a park ranger. I asked him what time it was and he said 1 p.m. 1 p.m. I was passed out at the bottom of this random mountain for 16 hours. No, this can't be. What about Chelsea? Where was she? I had many questions I wanted the answer to, but would probably never get the answer to. I looked up at the mountain and swore that I'd never climb any mountains ever again. It's been a couple days since that incident. Missing persons posters have gone up for Chelsea, and I can't get the image of that old man and the two kids out of my head. I have tried to sleep it off multiple times, but to no avail for two reasons. One, it's too haunting to forget, and two, I can't sleep. Mostly because of the howling outside, and the three pairs of eyes staring at me through my window. Just a few days before Christmas, my mom asked if me and my girlfriend could look after the house and take care of the dogs while she went on a week-long vacation with her boyfriend. We agreed, and the first few days were quite normal. My mom's house is on the edge of a small town in upstate New York. It's a peaceful place, and not much usually goes on except for occasional road work. It happened about three nights after we started staying at my mom's place. My girlfriend and I were just chilling on the couch. She was busy with her phone, and I was deep into playing Pokemon Shield on Switch. The clock was ticking, and it was around midnight. Suddenly, we heard heavy footsteps from outside. It was kind of creepy because someone with really big boots had walked up onto the porch. The layout of my mom's house is interesting. There's a couch against the wall, and big windows on both sides of it. So from where we were sitting, we could hear and see things happening outside. On the wall opposite to us is the front porch, so this guy was right behind us. He stomped around the porch, making heavy sounds. Then he got really close to the window on the left side of the couch and grunted, Ugh! Hell! In a deep, angry voice. My girlfriend and I were frozen in place, trying to understand what just happened. It took about five seconds for us to snap out of it. We quickly got up and decided to turn off all the lights in the house. Then we tiptoed to the laundry room, a place where he couldn't see us. After a little while, I felt like it might be safe to go to a different room and check if we could turn any lights back on. But when I peeked out of the window, I saw this big, burly guy shuffling down the sidewalk opposite our house. It was around midnight in a small town, and it's not the kind of place where things like this happen often. The street was quiet, and the only sound was his footsteps on the sidewalk. The guy had a plastic bag in his hands, and he seemed a bit out of place with the late hour. Remember, it's very late at night in a quiet town, so none of the stores are open for him to get a plastic bag. 
The guy keeps doing this strange shuffle while holding the bag. Then all of a sudden, he starts moving really fast in a funny way, across the street toward the parking lot near my house. And then he disappears. I go back to the laundry room and told her about what I saw. Then I bring her back to the window where I was looking to see if we can find the guy again. But he's not there. We check other windows in the house to see if he's outside any of those. My girlfriend looks out her window on the other side of the house. And that's when she saw him. But he's walking away. We talk about whether we should call the cops. And then suddenly we hear knocks on the door on the other side of the house. We rush over and the doorknob is jiggling like someone is trying to open it. But luckily, it was locked. Then one of my mom's dogs, a small rescue pup, starts barking like crazy and growling at whatever's on the other side. He has a really loud, screechy bark, and I think that scared the person away. We called my mom to ask for advice. Then we thought about calling the cops. But around here, the cops aren't known for being super helpful, so we decided against it. My mom also told us not to bother because she thought it might be someone who was drunk or high and didn't know what they were doing. Later I found out, it's not the first time someone showed up at our door all messed up in the middle of the night, but I'm not really sure what the guy's intentions were, and I'm really glad I didn't have to find out. When I spent the night at my friend's house in middle school, we liked staying up late. But the only tricky part was that the bathroom was near his parents' room, and we didn't want to get in trouble for waking them up, especially during those late-night nature calls. So, to avoid any problems, we came up with a plan. Instead of using the bathroom, we quietly sneaked out through the basement door and went into the woods to take care of business. The door was almost always open, because we sometimes forgot our keys and got locked out. It happened a lot since we often went out to do things in the woods. On this night, my friend's older brother was around, and he kept barging in through the basement door, making the situation even more chaotic. So we came up with a plan to try and stop my friend's brother from constantly barging in. We decided to lock the door, even though we knew it wouldn't really keep him out. The idea was that he'd have to use the key, and maybe that would take away some of the fun for him. But around midnight, we heard the door handle jiggling. At first, I didn't think much of it, assuming it was just his brother messing around. Then, after about five minutes of the handle being jiggled on and off, we got a bit frustrated. That's when we decided to take action. We went up to the door, hit it, and shouted at him to stop. However, all we got in response was silence. That was a good thing, and we hoped it was all over, right? But about ten minutes later, the jiggling started again, and it kept happening. This whole thing repeated for about two hours. No matter how many times we told him to stop, he didn't listen. We got frustrated and just said, forget it, and decided to ignore him. Even after we stopped paying attention, he kept going for about half an hour more. It felt like forever. Then finally he gave up. Let's jump ahead to around 9 in the morning. We were just waking up and one of my friend needed to use the bathroom. You know how it is at sleepovers. People are sleeping wherever there's space. When one person starts moving around, it wakes everyone up. We all started stretching and heading to the bathroom to get rid of the soda we drank the night before. As I walked out, I grabbed the door handle to close it behind me and noticed it felt weird, like it had a rough texture. When I checked it, I saw that the area around the keyhole was messed up. There were big scratch marks everywhere, and the metal parts were all bent and crooked. I asked my friend who lived there what happened, and he said it was the first time he noticed it. We didn't want to get blamed for what his brother did, so we went upstairs and explained everything to his parents. When his dad went downstairs to see what we were talking about, his face went all pale, and he hurried back upstairs to call the police. It turned out that someone had been trying to force the lock open while we were all in the house. It was pretty scary to think that someone had been trying to get in while we were sleeping. This happened to me more than once on different occasions. What made me really scared this time was that the person knew we were in the house 
and we knew someone was trying to break in. But he still kept trying to force his way inside, and it was pretty disturbing. I have no idea what kind of person he was, or what he had in mind for us that night. This happened around 10 years ago, when I was 14. At that time, I lived in an old farmhouse way out on a country road. Our house was surrounded by cornfields, and our nearest neighbors were two to three miles away. Living there was good because not many people came to our door to sell things or talk about religion, but a very few did. One night, only my mom and I, we were baking treats to sell and raise money for my little brother's Boy Scout group. My dad and brother were away, helping my uncle with some cows, if I remember correctly. We were busy in the kitchen, chatting and laughing. Soon we heard someone knocking on the door. A regular, everyday knock, like tap, tap, tap. Mom. Hmm. She mumbled to herself and took off her dish gloves to open the door. I stood at the kitchen island, rolling out some dough for a few pies and also watching my mother go to the door. I felt a little nervous in my stomach, but I thought it was just my usual worries. As my mom went to the door, the person outside tapped again, but this time it was like a beat tap tap tap. My mom stopped and turned back, looking pale. She walked back to the kitchen and went to the window facing the porch. She went to the side where you could see the porch really well. Mom pulled the curtain a bit to peek without anyone seeing her from outside. Then she went to the other side of the window to check the driveway. I had stopped what I was doing because at this point, making pie crusts didn't seem that important. Mom's eyes got big when she looked outside. Then she closed the curtain and stared at the floor. Her face showed both anger and fear. She took my wrist and led us to the closet, asking quietly if I had my cell phone. I did. Then, from the closet, she took out my dad's special Louisville Slugger baseball bat. Suddenly, the person outside banged on the door really loud. I gasped a little. Mom looked at me, telling me to be quiet, and took my arm. We went to my parents' bedroom and she locked the door and windows as we walked. At one point, she stopped at the living room window to peek outside. She closed it fast and made a frustrated noise. We made it to the bedroom and she pulled me inside, locking the door. Mom took my phone and started dialing while handing me the bat. She sat me down on the floor where I'd be out of sight from the door and opened the closet to get the gun case. She spoke quietly on the phone, but I was really scared and couldn't concentrate on what she was saying. She took out my dad's shotgun and loaded it fast. I looked at her frightened when she hung up the phone. She pulled me up again and led me out of the bedroom. We sneaked over to the other side of the house where the bathroom was. Mom gave me my phone and gestured for me to go inside. She put down the gun and looked at me with both hands on my shoulders. You have to listen. Some guys are outside, walking around the side of the house. I stared at her, eyes wide, feeling myself shaking. Why? What do they want? I don't know, but you have to stay in here, lock the door, and don't come out until I say. Got it? I nodded and she squeezed my shoulders. I'm going to block the door from the other side. I won't remove it until I tell you it's safe. I understood right away. I heard her push the heavy quartz chest in front of the door, a box filled with quartz for many years. I sat on the floor by the window, holding onto the baseball bat. It felt like a really long time, but it was just five minutes. While I sat there, I heard two footsteps outside the window, and two deep voices talking quietly. Are they really inside? Maybe not. No, there's at least two ladies inside. Heard them talking at the door. I got scared, started breathing fast, but covered my mouth with a towel to keep it quiet. Who were these people? Soon, I heard another voice. Guys, let's go. Charlie saw cops down the road. Then I heard three sets of feet running toward the front of the house. I was crying a lot by now tears pouring down my face. Was it over? Were they leaving? After a few more minutes, I heard a man's voice in the house. I started to panic, huddling into the bathroom corner. I heard my mom's voice on the other side of the bathroom door saying, It's me. The sheriff's here. 
They're gone. I'm moving the trunk. I stood up, unlocked the door, and opened it. The sheriff and my mom were moving the trunk out of the way. I ran to my mom's arms quickly, and we stood there hugging. The sheriff said more officers were chasing the van, and he needed to ask me and my mom some questions. My mom nodded, and we went to the kitchen where the air smelled like burnt cookies. The sheriff asked us questions, and that's when I found out what my mom saw. When she looked out and saw the man knocking at our door, she knew something was wrong right away. He was dressed casually in gym shorts and a tank top, not what a salesman or someone from a church would wear when visiting. So my mom thought maybe his car broke down or something, and he needed help. She looked out at the driveway and saw something that scared her. There was a van in our driveway, parked so my mom's car couldn't leave. There was a man in the passenger seat, and another leaning towards the front of the van, talking to the passenger. But my mom noticed, even though both were still, the van was slightly rocking, like there were more people inside. While my mom and I were talking to the sheriff, a deputy came in, and he looked really pale. He looked at my mom, the sheriff and me, and he said, Sir, we caught up with the van. They lost control and swerved into the ditch, actually. Are any of them hurt? No, they're okay, but uh, we have them in custody. The sheriff raised an eyebrow. There were five guys in the van. We asked them why they were here and why they were walking around your house. And what did they say? They claimed to be vacuum salesmen, sir. A team selling the product they made. The sheriff scoffed a bit. They took my mom outside and told her what they found. She came back inside crying and holding on to me. After that, they called my dad and he rushed home. My other uncle, a really big guy, stayed that night just in case. My mom didn't spare any expense on home security and taught both of us kids how to shoot and load a gun. My aunt and uncle gave us one of their German shepherd puppies. Mom had to train him to be a guard dog, but he was a goofy and affectionate pup when not on duty. However, even with that, mom still wasn't reassured. My brother and I ended up going to self-defense lessons to make her feel safer. It wasn't until a few years later, while we were making cookies and homemade candy for a Christmas party, that I finally asked my mom about what was in the van. She was surprised that I asked, but knew I would find out eventually. So what was in the van? They found rope, tape, burlap sacks, and even sedatives. After taking the guys back and hours of questioning, one of them finally broke and admitted they were having no luck catching anyone in town, so they went to rural areas. Even now, I'm very careful about who I open the door for, and I can't sleep without having some kind of weapon in the bedside table. It has really broken my trust in others. A couple of years ago, when I was 25, I shared an apartment with one of my best friends. But sadly, our friendship started fading as she wasn't around much. However, on this particular night, she decided to stay over and went to bed early. Due to my job schedule, I often stayed up late, and during that time, my routine usually involved watching YouTube videos and relaxing. So, on this particular night was pretty normal, but something strange happened. My neighbors actually tried to kidnap me. Now let me share a bit more about where I lived and who my neighbors were. Our house had three bedrooms, and the two bedrooms, along with the kitchen, faced the neighbors who were a young couple residing in a smaller mill house. They kept showing up at our door, always asking for weird stuff. I'm usually cool with helping neighbors, but these requests were kinda odd. For example, they wanted us to fill up this old Mountain Dew bottle with water because theirs got turned off or something. They also asked for beer, and one time they literally asked us for just a dollar. It was getting a bit weird. When we didn't answer, I'd peek through the window to check. It was strange. Sometimes I'd catch them grabbing leftover cigarette butts from the ashtray or squishing their eyes against the door peephole trying to see if we were home. So I'm sitting on the couch watching YouTube when I hear a knock at the door. I rolled my eyes because I knew exactly who was knocking. It was 11 p.m., and when I checked through the little door window, there he was the boyfriend on my porch. Normally, 
I'd just ignore it and go on with my night, but this time he looked kind of troubled. So I decided to open the door and see what was up. Hey, um, I just wanted to ask if you could do me a favor. I got a ring here in my pocket for my girlfriend, and I need someone to record the moment. Can you follow me to my backyard and film it for me? He nervously asked. It was unexpected. I was pretty confused, but really wanted to find out what was happening. I congratulated him and told him I'd join in a moment. I just needed to put on my shoes. Once I closed and locked the door, I rushed to the back room with a view of their backyard. Peeking through the blinds, I expected to see some decorations or a setup, but it was totally dark, no signs of anything. It felt odd, so without wasting time, I woke up my roommate to share the whole story with her. Um, no way, she told me, and we both walked back to the door after the boyfriend started banging on it. I peeked through the little door window again. It was pretty dark outside and I couldn't see much. Then, I saw him move his eye away from the peephole. It gave me a chill, and I quickly turned around, pressing my back against the door. My roommate hurried back to the door from her room, grabbing two wire hangers like they were shields. We both clung to the hangers and sat against the door until he finally left. It was pretty scary, but we wanted to be sure we weren't overreacting. So we decided to go out through the back door and hopped into her car for a quick drive around the neighborhood. They always kept their front door wide open and there were no blinds, so you could easily see inside their house. We drove by slowly in her car, sneaking into the living room. On the couch, the couple and the older man were all just sitting there, staring at the wall. We quickly drove away and decided to stay at a friend's house that night. After that, I stopped answering the door for them. But one day, when I came home from work, I noticed an older lady parked in their driveway. As I got out of my car, she walked up to me and asked if I knew where the neighbors were. I explained that I hadn't seen them in quite a while. Then I asked her who she was, and she informed me that she was the owner of the house. She told me they hadn't paid rent for months, and it led to her having to evict them. When she went inside the house, it was a disaster. Needles scattered, garbage all over, walls with holes and even a mess on the floor. I expressed my sympathy for what she had to deal with and mentioned that I was glad they were finally out. But thinking about the condition of their house, I felt a sense of relief that I hadn't followed him to the backyard. And who knows what he might have had planned that night. When I was 19 years old, I had a job in the small mall in my quiet town. In our town, not many serious crimes happen, and it's a peaceful place. However, the city that's about 15 minutes away used to have the highest murder rates in Canada. The mall where I worked was not too big, and it was a common spot for moms with their kids and older people looking to pass the time. It's a really safe mall where I work. Not a sketchy one at all. But one day during my break, I headed to the food court to grab a drink and scrolling my phone just like I always do. As I sat there, I noticed two women walking towards me. My first guess was that they saw my work uniform, and I thought they might have questions about something my store sells. I didn't think anything bad was happening. They walked up to me and sat down quickly at my table in the food court. Both of them talked with strong accents, though I wasn't sure what kind because I hadn't heard it before. They were dressed really fancy, like they were going to church or a special event, and seemed pretty regular. Nothing strange about them. Then one of the women takes out a book, and they start asking me some strange questions like, mostly things about religion. So I think they might be some kind of missionaries. They start telling me about God the Mother. Since I'm really shy, I just listen to them talk. Then they invite me to a youth group they organized for that evening. I'm a bit surprised, not expecting such an invitation during my break at the mall. I said I was at work, just taking a break so going with them wasn't possible, but they kept insisting. I had to repeat a few times that I couldn't join. Finally they got the message, but then they asked for my phone number. They said they'd text me the details the next time they organized something. I felt a bit uneasy, but gave them my number to end the conversation. A couple of days later, I got a text from them trying to plan something for the youth group. 
I felt a bit trapped because I wasn't really interested, but I didn't want to be rude. I hesitated for a moment, thinking about whether to reply or not. Eventually, I decided to block the number. It wasn't that I thought they were going to do something bad. I just wasn't into the idea of going to a youth group. I hoped blocking the number would make it clear that I wasn't interested without having to explain it. A few months later, I was reading the news, and there was a story about a warning for young girls in our city regarding a human trafficking scheme. The report mentioned a tactic where women would approach and talk about God the Mother, trying to convince people to leave with them. I felt a rush of relief, realizing that I hadn't finished my shift that day when those women approached me. I wondered what might have happened. Moreover, I was thankful that I never responded to their text. It's strange to think about how a small decision like that might have kept me safe. I'm a middle-aged guy working a boring nine. Five job. It's the most boring job in the world. The job of an accountant. I work in a great bank. But it doesn't matter so much to me because it helps me to pay the bills. I've never fit anywhere. I fit into the shy, awkward nerd category. I may or may not go so far to say that I'm unattractive, but women always love to avoid me like the plague. So imagine my surprise when a very attractive woman took an interest to me in my cousin's wedding. It started out great, and oddly enough that our vibe matched, and even our likes, dislikes, and hobbies. I took one look at her and felt something I haven't felt for years. It was totally love at first sight. I thought she liked me too. As we talked more and more, I became more and more fascinated by her. I also felt a little lightheaded. The edges of my vision started to blur. When I told her that I wasn't feeling so well and wanted to call it a night, she insisted to come with me to my room. I reluctantly agreed, as I had trust issues. Also, no woman ever wanted to spend a night with me, so there was that. When we entered the room, my cousin let me stay for the night. I turned on the corridor light. No, please, turn it off, please, I heard her squeal. We did everything in the dark. I distinctly remember the little nibbles, almost like tickles, that I felt when she was making love to me. It even got weirder when I started to notice these weird round spots that began to appear on my legs. Then they turned into huge and painful pus-filled boils. They slowly started to spread until they left these huge scabby holes on the skin of my legs. My GP diagnosed it as an unusually strong drug-resistant strain of necrotizing fasciitis, flesh-eating bacteria. In the meantime, my doctors continued to give me loads of antibiotics, but none worked. The condition of my legs gradually worsened. I wondered where she was. As I lay there on the hospital bed, being fed and medicated through IV, my sedatives kicking in, I saw her casually walk in. Hi, I muttered, struggling to stay awake. There was something very different about her face. She smiled at me, displaying sharp and narrow piranha teeth. My eyes widened in shock. She put her mouth close to my ears and whispered, So sorry about your legs, but I enjoyed my time with you. You smelled so good that I couldn't resist. Your meat was the best thing that I've ever tasted so far. When I bit you, the poison from my teeth got into your skin. But I didn't want this to happen to you. Anyway, I hope you missed me because I am not done with you. Then I heard her chuckle. Suddenly, the light in my room went out and I felt this tickling sensation all over my face and torso. You can't get away from this, I whispered. I heard her laugh. Oh, honey. I've been getting away with it for centuries, even before you were born. No man can resist me. She breathed into my ear, and I knew that I wasn't going to be alive for much longer. I didn't know what she was and where did she come from, but I knew that I will take her deadly secret with me to the grave. Maybe she was the monster created by the sins of men. <laughs>